Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just want to thank you so much. Just one more time. Just to gather into your house, Father. Just to lift up your name. Just to give you praise. Father, we thank you so much for all the efforts that you went through. At the, you held nothing back to prove to us that you are a living God. An intimate God. One who has gone through great extent to show yourself to, to us who you are. So, Father, as we open up your word and we continue to seek your face, Father, we just ask that you would fill this room with your spirit and that you would uh, just minister to our hearts, that you would plant seeds, Father, that would just grow and uh, help us just to stand in awe of you as we just worship you. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, guys. So... I think I'm going to change the way I'm going to open up here. So last week we followed Moses. We followed Moses. <laughs> Maybe we didn't follow Moses. There we go. Where he was up in uh, Jacob's family, came up to Goshen. We talked about that. And then when Moses was there, he had killed an Egyptian, went on the run. He took off, came all the way across to Midian, where God met him at Mount Sinai, whether it's here or here, and talked to him in a burning bush, and returned back to Egypt, and started his journey. After all of the plagues, we remember, come the last plague of Passover, they went on the run, went on the lamb, <laughs> no. um, took off through Pithom, came into Sukkoth, Etham, came back over to the bitter lakes or the bitter sea there, came down to Mara, Elam, through the desert, to Rephidim, and to Mount Horeb. And that is where we basically left off. And the book of Leviticus is kind of that book of God's guidebook for his newly redeemed people, showing them how to worship, serve, and obey a holy God. Fellowshipping with God through sacrifice and obedience, Leviticus focused on the worship and the walk of the nation of Israel. So that is basically where they're at now. They're sitting at the foot of Sinai, and this caught my attention just a little bit ago. So the key word for Leviticus is holiness. And it says Leviticus centers on this concept of holiness of God and how an unholy people can acceptably approach him and then remain in continued, continued fellowship. The way to God is only through blood sacrifice and the walk with God is only through obedience to his law. Okay. So the, the uh, key word is going to be holiness. The key verse is in Leviticus 4, uh, 17, 11, where it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. And then on 20, verse 7 and 8, it says, Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statue and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And the key chapter is going to be chapter 16. The Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, was the most important single day in the Hebrew calendar as it was the only day the high priest entered into the holy place to make atonement for you, to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. That is basically the whole content of Leviticus. And Leviticus takes approximately about one month for Moses to write or that they were there at the, at the Mount Sinai. What is interesting is I never was able to confirm this, but I've come to a couple different places that has mentioned it. So it's one of those things that I catch very interesting, but there's that equal space lettering where you take one letter, you go the same amount. I think it's 70, 70 letters. You take that letter and you go 70 letters and take that letter. 
Well, in Genesis and Exodus, if you do that, you find the first T and you go equal letters. It goes to O and then the R and then the H. So in Genesis and Exodus, it goes from left to right, Torah. On Numbers and Deuteronomy, same thing, but it goes backwards. So instead of T-O-R-H, it's H-R-O-T, facing this way. And then in Leviticus, the equal spacing discovery was Yahweh. So the law is pointing to God. Okay? So the mysteries that I think that are in this book are beyond what we even can gather, even take from it. Okay? So what I wanted to do was we started off in the tabernacle. This is a model that they put somewhere else because I don't think they had a tar road back then. <laughs> I could be a little bit behind my time, but I don't think they did. However, I thought it was very interesting on how it might have looked kind of coming from an aerial view, kind of a wide view of what it might look like. Okay? I think that's kind of cool. Last week, we talked about the articles that are in the... Let me make sure I got my world right here. Okay. So last week, we talked about the articles in the um, tabernacle. Okay. So this is how they would have been set up in the tabernacle. So you have the one door coming in. You have the brazen altar and the laver. Inside the holy place, you have the lampstand, showbread table, golden, uh, the golden altar of incense. And then inside you had the mercy seat and the, uh, and the Holy of Holies and the, and the Ark of the Testament. Yeah, Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so that's what the inside of that last, that's what this is all about. Okay. This is... Because I'm all about the maps going back to pointing back to Jesus. I think I want to take, um, who's got their Bible open? Let's look up John 8, 12. Whoever gets there first. I guess I should probably do it since I have the microphone. Huh? So then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This is the only source of light that is inside the holy place. Okay. Let's go to Hebrews 7.25. The incense was a form of prayer. Seven twenty five will say, Therefore he is also able to save us the uttermost those that come to God through him, and he always lives to make intercession for them. Intercession is a type of prayer. That's what the altar of incense was, was a sweet fragrance, a prayer, uh, intercession. John 6, 25. Sorry, we'll go back to John. John 6, 25. And since I see that 59 there, I'm hoping I didn't do a misprint. Um, so verse 47 says, most surely I say to you, 
He who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your father ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Here's the showbread table. 1 John 1, 9. Verse 9, uh, chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is where the priests would cleanse their hands or cleanse themselves. Uh, I don't know if it was before or after the sacrifice. but And then John one twenty nine, you can see that John has a theme here, as we know all too well, that he John represents Jesus from the eagle's point of view of being the deity, the book of deity, if you will. And so John one twenty nine says, The next day John saw, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This copper altar is where the sin, uh, the offering was to be placed in here. Okay, so we see that it's made of a bronze. Bronze is the medal of judgment. So this is kind of that judgment of sin here, who Jesus is. The copper base, he cleanses us of the judger of our sins, cleanser of our sins. So, and then when I got down to John 20, verse 12, and this one here, okay, so I'll humble myself here. The mercy seat I get, which is what we're going to look up right now. Twenty verse twelve, and it says, "And he saw the two angels in white sitting one at the head. This is this one, Mary. Let me back up. So, but Mary stood outside of the tomb weeping, and she wept. She stooped down and looked in the tomb." And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laying. You see that you have the two angels, one at the head, one at the feet. Um, and probably, and remind me, Sandy, is the blood sacrificed on the, placed on the mercy seat? The sprinkling. sprinkling of it? So... When Jesus had died, the blood that he had shed was on that mercy seat. So the mercy seat I get, but then it went to the Ark of the Covenant. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find anything that dealt well with the Ark of the Covenant. So then I started thinking, okay, what is the Ark of the Covenant or Ark of Testimony? Well, then I found out that the jar of manna is in the Ark of the, of the Testimony. So, yeah, the Bread of Life. Aaron's staff was in there. And if I remember the story correctly, all 12 tribes put a staff down, and God would choose one by budding the staff. What I did not know was that was how he selected the high priest. So... This is the high priest inside the tabernacle. I mean, inside the Ark of the Testimony. And then you have the Ten Commandments where Jesus goes on to say, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Okay? So, do we see a theme on where all these point to? <laughs> okay? Is that a good map right there? I thought it really was. Okay? Okay? The offerings. As I was going through this, this is a big piece of paper. This one's probably really detailed, 
but I thought it was really, really good. It has not only the offerings, but also the feasts. And it has the dates on them, I think, and when it was done. And so the burnt offering was the complete consecration of the offer to God. The Christ in it is that Christ gave himself as a whole burnt offering on the altar of the cross. The meal offering was a consecration of the offerer's toil and possession. Christ is the corn of wheat, bruised in the mill of Calvary and offered as the bread of life to the people. Remember Christ said in John 2, uh, 12, that unless, a matter of fact, I don't want to misquote it, so let me, 12, 24, Most surely I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So he's referring to himself, I believe, there. Then you have the peace offering, which is the reconciliation of the offerer with God. Christ is our peace offering. And what I thought was really cool is when you go in, and I want to give you this paper. Did I give it to you? Apparently not. Or maybe not. But going in and looking up these verses goes through and explains them and how Jesus was that. The sin offering. Expiation of the sin of the offer. Christ is our sin offering. Second Corinthians 5.21 And the trespass offering. He was to make reparations and restitution for the trespass of the offer. Christ is our trespass offering. Second Coloss uh, Colossians 2, 13 and 14 and 2 Corinthians. So the furniture of the tabernacle points to Jesus. The burnt offering, I mean the offerings of the Lord are all he's our burnt offering, the meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, trespass offering. What I thought was really cool I think I'm going to give it to you next week is there's five. And in my mind, when I read five, I think of five being the number of grace. So God's grace being poured out by him being the full offering. I made this just as a quick little, it's a simpler form of what you have in that big one. But it talks about the Passover, the unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits. You're welcome. The feast of weeks, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles. Let me see what my next one is here. <laughs> okay, so I got really excited on this, okay? So I went crazy with how this went down. I'm going to come back here so we can see it, but here is another detail of the just the feasts and how they took place. So it has them as the slaves in Egypt um, and then the Christ, oh, sorry, and then the Christ in them. So I know, I know, I get carried away with all my little handouts, but what you're going to find 14th and eyes on is when the Passover takes place. Okay? That's when the Passover lamb is killed. That's the day that Jesus was crucified. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is they were kind of the bitter memory of them being in, in Egypt, but that was the sinless leaven is a representation of sin. This is unleavened bread. So it is a symbol of sinlessness. Then you have the feast of first fruits. Feast of first fruits was the 
festival of the first harvest and whatever that they had planted that had died in the ground was now coming forth and was plentiful. So it's kind of the resemblance of the first of the dead coming out of the ground. And that was Jesus was, and that's where I got excited. This is where my excitement gets started. Is what feast is it? But you have, and these all go together. This is the 14th of Nizon. This is the 15th of Nizon. This says it's the Sabbath, but it sits on the third day. So what happened on the third day? The resurrection. So this is the resurrection of Jesus. As I started to figure out the feast of first fruit, uh, the feast of weeks, Pentecost, that holiday was celebrated with two loaves of leavened bread. Sim symbolizing that the Jews and the church are sinful people. So Pentecost puts together the two loaves of leavened bread because we're sinful people. But what was interesting is day one, day two, third day comes out of the grave. 40 days later, well, that's a lie. Seven weeks is when Pentecost starts, which is 49 days plus one. They put it on the 50th day. When Jesus came out of the grave, he spoke with his disciples for 40 days. Then he ascended. Guess how many days later did Pentecost take place where the Holy Spirit came? Ten days. <laughs> because it's the satisfying of the Pentecost here, which is 50 days later. So I started getting excited because you have the death, you have the burial, you have the resurrection. 50 days later, Pentecost, and, 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 and what's hard is you have to try to divide this, is this is all Old Testament. So to say Pentecost, the actual feast, and that's what I gave you those papers for, is when you, when you get a chance, go through and look at them, because um, it's just the celebration that Israel did in the Old Testament. Had nothing to do with Jesus. Sandy threw my wife to the floor with a statement that she made yesterday that without all of this in the Old Testament, Jesus dying on the cross 2,000 years later would have meant nothing. Is that how you said it? Something close to that? no sacrificial system, then Jesus being sacrificed would have not been a sacrifice. It would have just been some guy dying the way all these other all the other people died, died right? Would exactly. Be, there would have been no value behind it. Into a system that God created in order for us to atone. And without that system, we would have never understood it. So that fired off a huge conversation between Dina and I, because it's almost like God started at the end of the book and then went backwards. So everything would lead back to Jesus, you know? And when I was pondering that, it was like, if we went to known what sacrifice was, then when John said, behold, here comes the lamb of God. What lamb of God? What does that mean? You know, well, he's, you know, being sacrificed for our sins. It's like sacrifice for our sins. So without all the old Testament setting up of it, it would have had no value come time to Jesus. So very thought provoking. Thank you for that. Uh, all right, so then I gave you that one already. So now I, I jumped into numbers a little bit. This is in numbers, but when we come into next week getting into numbers, I didn't want to have to stop for this. So I went ahead and added this. 
So Mount Sinai, God puts this whole thing together. Now we're going into numbers where he takes a census and pointing to the East first, he breaks down the numbers, which is going to be the camp of Judah. So Judah has 74,000, Iskar 4, Zebulun 57, 186. As you can already put together, it's a cross because God said that it had to be the north, the south, the east, or the west, not northeast, southeast, whatever. So as wide as the tabernacle was, was as far as they could go out wide. So they created these legs. I see a lot of pictures out there that have it like a square around it. But because it all leads back to Jesus, I am one who believes just like this. So you have the equal parts, 151, 157, and then 108, the shortest being on the top. What I thought was inter interesting when I was doing the study on this before is that the longest leg is in the east. So it's almost like God's pointing to the east that if you were to raise that cross up, you're looking east. And when he says that when he comes in Revelation, where is he going to come from? I think he's going to be coming from the east, right? So from there, the, and, and I can't find the verse for this and it's driving me nuts. I've been asking and can't find it. But you'll see that the symbols or the banners that surround the Levites are basically the same ones as what the gospel is considered to be. Uh, Matthew is the ox. No. Luke, John. There's a lion. He's a lion because it's about his royalty. Talks about him being the, the, the king to come. In Matthew, Mark, he is a servant. So he's recognized as the ox or the, the gospel is Luke is the man talks about how he feels. And then John is his deity. So these are the gospels surrounding the Levites of the priesthood. But what made that very interesting is I believe in the book of Daniel book of revelation. I think for sure. What four faces do the angels have? Those are the four faces of the angels. So <laughs> back to the very beginning inside all the furniture is in there. Okay. Inside is where the sacrifice and the offerings were done. Just outside is the gospel or the angels. And it's all sitting in the center of the cross. So to me, that's why I wanted to take time to do this because it's a map without having any places in it. It's, it's all that spiritual map leading us back to, to the camp of Israel or to back to Jesus, to the camp of Israel. There's one more place in numbers that comes up that again, I want to hit it before next week. And that is the bronze serpent. Scripture says that the Lord sent fiery ser serpents among the people. They bit the people that many of the Israelites died. So the people came to Moses and said, uh, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he might remove the serpent from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a stand, and it shall become that anyone who is bitten, who looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze altar and a serpent and set it on the standard. And it became that if any serpent bit a man, any man, he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. You guys know what that is all about. Got a pretty good group. Why a serpent? What does a serpent mean? Where does the serpent come from? Where is the first place that the serpent comes from that we know of? Garden of Eden. 
It's a type of sin, right? But it's, it's and <laughs> to make it all the more confusing. And what's interesting is this. I'm not even following my notes. I'm just having a good time over here. So in the Canaanites, the, uh, this is uh, Numbers 21.1. It says, when the Canaanites, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Etherim, then he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. So Israel made a vow to the Lord. There it is. Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver these people into our hands, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. Thus, the name of that place is called Homar. This is a good thing, right? But here comes Israel. Then they set out to Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go to the land of Edom. And the pe people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up into Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water, and we loathe the miserable food. Remember, that was the manna that they're, they're referring to. So God sent the bronze serpent. Serpent comes down, bites people. People are dying left and right. Here's where it gets a little bit confusing. In the New Testament, it says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. What's it mean? Correct. So now you're looking at bronze judgment. So you have bronze over the serpent. So you have judgment over sin. That's why Jesus said the same way that Moses lifted up judgment over sin. So shall the son of man be lifted up that he's the judger of our sin. So. In numbers in the Torah and the five books that it takes us all back to who Jesus is and the detail, the designing. I mean, the more I'm going through this, the more that I see the detailed handiwork of a designer creating this. So it doesn't matter which angle you're coming from. It all leads us back to Christ. And that just gets me extremely excited. Um, so one more handout because I want you guys to know the, this is the cross in the old Testament. I don't know if I had mentioned that, but when you start seeing new Testament stuff in the old Testament, I mean, again, it's just God's handiwork just going through and bringing us back to him. The Old Testament is in the New Testament concealed. The New Testament, no, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Yeah. And that's, and yeah, over. and that's exactly what it is. You know, and I had always divided the Old and the New Testament. But, you know, that's why you always hear pastors all around, you know, put a little thread, glue it here, connect it over here. And... We're not going to be going through the New Testament this year, but maybe next year we'll go through it and we're going to see all those places coming back to the Old Testament or all those places that are in the Old Testament coming out in the New Testament. So it's, it's, it's to your point, it's fun. And that's what I'm seeing. And that's why I want, that's why I, and I hope I set this up well that you guys could see it. Go through those pages. I think this one, the, the, the colored one might be the easier one to get through than that big long one. But if you're into a glutton for punishment, that long one seemed to have a really, really good amount of information. <clears throat> but because there was no movement in the book of Leviticus, that ends our night. There was nothing else that they did while they were there. Huh? Yeah, they sat at the foot of of Mount Sinai for Leviticus was a month long. Yeah. And 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 you know, it's all about 
all the rules, the regulations, the sacrifices, the offerings, it's all in there. Um, but that's what we highlighted on tonight. Cool? So let's just close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that I have served you well, that, uh, that this would spark a interest in your word, Father, knowing that these are hidden for the diligent seeker to find, Father. So I pray that you would make us diligent seekers of your word, that that intimate relationship would just grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Thank you for all that you did, not only on the cross, Father, to give us a forgiveness of our sins, that you become our sin offering and our trespass offering, but uh, that you were that Lamb of God that died upon that cross to give us that freedom to come before you and live in you. So we thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.